Hello, I'm Warren Fay and welcome to another film in the series I'm doing on the precincts of the 2011 postcode. Today we're in Elizabeth Bay, or as it's colloquially known, Betty Bay. The story of Elizabeth Bay goes back to the Aboriginal people that lived in the area who called it Yarrandabi. Uh, but it's after settlement, its story got away fairly early because Alexander Maclay was given a land grant, a whopping big land grant, by Governor Darling. And uh, it covered 54 acres, which essentially is what Elizabeth Bay is today, as we know it. The idea behind these land grants wasn't just a bit of a, uh, a gift for your mates. It was actually there to impress colonials. They, there were conditions. When somebody was given a land grant, they were expected to build a notable uh, building, a house on the property. They were also expected to um, make gardens, uh, possibly fruit and vegetable sections of that garden, and generally set an example for other colonials that this is how it should be done. Mr. Maclay uh, came out from England. He was already notable to some degree in, in an organisation called the Linnean Society. And the Linnean Society um, was interested in collecting specimens of plants and uh, insects. Uh, Maclay himself had a huge collection, probably one of the biggest in the world, of butterflies. Anyway, he set about building this extraordinary home, which uh, eventually became known as Elizabeth Bay House. The Elizabeth part of the story came from Governor Macquarie, who named the area for his wife, Elizabeth. Mr. Maclay engaged the notable colonial architect, John Verge, who in partnership with uh, Bibb, his, his other cohort in designing some very fine buildings, including Rockwell and Tusculum up at Potts Point. But Mr. Maclay had a dream. I suspect it really came to a nightmare in the end because uh, he kept having to um, pump money into this massive development. The house, which is still standing of course, and is the Elizabeth Bay House, uh, it's a museum that's looked after by um, Sydney Museums, that was the Historic Houses Trust, and it has an ongoing program of events and it's always worth popping in and having a look. But to imagine the Maclay family living there um, with this expansive garden, a garden that was known throughout Sydney as that wonder of a garden of Mr. Maclay's. Now the entrance to Elizabeth Bay at that time was where approximately the El Alamein Fountain stands today. So the carriages would enter the gates, they must have been quite big gates, and then wind their way round down onto the, the house on Onslow Place. Um, it's um, a beautiful house, ma massive staircase, but this was what villas of the time looked like. Probably not as impressive as Mr. Maclay's. Um, the other notable aspects of the story is that when he started to run out of money, he started to hive off some of the land. The first section he sold off was to a fellow Scotsman, um, Gordon, uh, his name was Gordon, his surname, and he was the one that built Manar, and he built a cottage on Manar where the current uh, Manar building complex stands today, uh, where I happen to live. Um, and he then started to sell bit by bit the rest of the 54 acres of Elizabeth Bay. And the houses that were built in the area 
are fine examples of Art Deco and particularly Spanish mission styles. Um, the most notable being probably Boomerang, which was built in 1926 by Frank Albert, who was the, uh, the gentleman who made so much money by publishing songs in the early story of Sydney. He had the Boomerang songster and quite a few other songsters, but he also imported musical instruments and he was a leading figure in the music story of Australia. He built this amazing property, uh, Boomerang, uh, which we would describe as Hollywood Mission, Spanish Mission. Uh, it obviously still stands today. And um, it, uh, the other notable Spanish mission houses down the other end of Billiard Avenue would be Del Rio. Now, during the 1930s and 40s, the whole of 2011, particularly King's Cross, Potts Point and Elizabeth Bay, uh, saw a lot of development. A large number of the big houses, including Roslyn Hall, which was really as impressive well, maybe not quite so, but very impressive um, compared to Elizabeth Bay House. Uh, apparently had a staircase area where an oxen cart could go and circle round. That's <laughs> just saying that. But a lot of these old houses came down and these stones and bricks used in their uh, building were reused in apartment blocks. So Elizabeth Bay, like King's Cross and Potts Point, found itself in the 30s and 40s with a lot of high-rise apartment blocks. Now, the biggest problem here was, apparently, that uh, peeping toms used to come from all over Sydney. People curious to see how the other half lived, I guess. And they would uh, walk around the area and look in the windows, look in the doors, and uh, it used to drive the neighbours crazy. I mean, you have to realise in those days that, uh, that most people lived in the burbs and these high-rise developments uh, were quite a curio. Uh, they'd been happening since the 1870s, but the, the 1930s and late 20s and 30s and then the early 40s, uh, prior to the war years, uh, these buildings just shot up everywhere and they contributed to a different lifestyle. Elizabeth Bay did have a number of shops um, and restaurants. Uh, one by one, they sort of like rolled over. We still have some left today, um, but uh, most people would prefer to walk up to the big supermarkets and so forth that replaced these corner stores. Um, Elizabeth Bay, its proximity to the city and the fact it's surrounded by these glorious um, waters uh, makes it a fairly unique place to live. Um, I live in Elizabeth Bay, so I'm probably a bit prejudiced. <laughs>